I actually can't think of a situation in modern times where you've had a government initiated broad patent waiver. I can think of situations where you've had industry led patent waivers. So an example is Tesla. Tesla's got like a gazillion patents on the whole electric vehicle thing. They don't enforce all of them. They, to be clear, they have some they're happy to enforce. But what they wanted to do was to build up an infrastructure because it's good if there are like lots of charging stations around. And so that means, you know, having other electric car makers, you know, that's a good thing. But if you have your patent standing in a way, that's not a good thing. So Tesla was smart about that. One other thing you should know is that historically, pharmaceutical companies have been pretty good about licensing what I'll call platform technologies on reasonable commercial terms. Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast by the Houston Law Review, where we highlight legal issues with prominent lawyers and discuss the study and practice of law. I'm your host, Kevin Donovan. I'm joined here today by two IP attorneys from Millbank's Los Angeles office, partner and firm-wide head of IP, David Gindler, and senior associate Jasper Tran to discuss patent waiver of COVID vaccines and what it's like to be an IP attorney. Uh, just to give our guests some uh, background, or uh, our listeners some background on our guests, David and Jasper. David has been practicing law for over 35 years, has successfully represented clients in trials with verdicts in the hundreds of millions of dollars, negotiated complex IP license agreements, um, and frequently speaks on hot topics in IP law, and most notably uh, for our topic today, uh, topics on life sciences and pharmaceuticals. David, I, I also noticed that you're uh, the, a member of the board of directors for the, the Los Angeles uh, Philharmonic. Do you, do, you, uh, do you play any musical instruments or, or sing or anything like that? Well, you know, not anymore. You know, some people have a okay. career path that takes them to the law. Some people have a career path that takes them elsewhere. But when I was in junior high and high school, I played the bass in the school orchestra. And, you know, I wasn't I, the most popular. I also play the bass, David. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I minored in it in uh, undergrad and then also uh, stopped basically kind of playing. But Well, uh, I yeah. realized that there were people who were much better than I was. And at some point you realize you just can't keep up. But what it did do for me is it gave me a lifelong love of music, of classical music. You know, when I was a Absolutely. younger person in high school, you know, I had a student subscription to the L.A. Philharmonic. My seats were really far away but I really liked going. Wow. Well, I mean, that, that's amazing. It's amazing you get to uh, kind of contribute now with your skills as an attorney, you know, maybe maybe more so, maybe just as much as, as your skills as a bassist if you had pursued that. I, I played a, I played electric bass, so uh, I played I played in jazz ensemble, and I still I still do love some bass, although uh, the electric bassy songs are, are much more electric dance music and things of that sort now, but I, I do love classical as well, absolutely. Um, but that's really cool. Okay. Uh, and, and, and moving on to, uh, to Jasper, uh, just some background on Jasper. Uh, his practice focuses on complex patent and trade secret litigation in federal courts. And his experiences include due diligence on IPIT agreements in the in multi-billion dollar acquisitions. And really, really most interesting probably for our topic today is that you are, or for our, for our audience, is that you have authored uh, numerous scholarly articles on intellectual property for journals from law schools, uh, such as Yale and Northwestern, amongst others. Uh, and Jasper, I've, uh, I've read some of your articles preparing for this just on 3D printing, uh, 3D printing of food and bioprinting. Thought those were all really interesting. I'm pretty sure you've also written on some, some COVID uh, topics as well. So really interesting stuff. Uh, and uh, if you're okay with it, I'll, I'll put some of that in the show notes after if anyone wants to check out some of your scholarship. Sure. Yeah, that, that'd be great and happy to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yes, w welcome to the show. David and Jasper, real real pleasure to have both of you. But you know, want, want to move on now from uh, from our introductions, but not directly into uh, patent waiver of COVID vaccines. I'd like to first kind of delve a little bit into the basics of IP lawyering. And uh, I know I know from my perspective, and I think even uh, some you know maybe junior practicing attorneys' perspectives, 
Uh, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us know that IP attorneys are different, but don't really know why. So would love to hear from both of you and your perspective, what makes IP attorneys different than other attorneys? So we are specialists and we are specialists in the sense of we specialize in a given substantive area of law and our practice revolves around a given substantive area of law. Now, IP lawyers can come in different flavors. Uh, the flavor of IP lawyer um, that Jasper and I indulge is we're mostly patent litigators. That is, we uh, litigate and handle disputes between companies involving patent rights. We also do other related type of work. So for example, companies can have fights about trade secrets where one company accuses another company of stealing their trade secrets. That probably is a lot of the kind of work that Jasper and I do. There's other types of IP work, which is sometimes referred to as soft IP litigation. That can involve, for example, disputes among uh, companies over copyrights. So you can bring a lawsuit for copyright infringement and the like. You can bring a claim for trademark infringement. That is something which is not really a core part of the practice that we have here at Millbank. And it's really not the core practice of the people. When you think of intellectual property litigators, you're mostly thinking about people who are involved in disputes regarding patent rights and disputes regarding trade secrets. As for the practice that we have here at Millbank, it is not limited to any one given area of technology. We handle matters in a variety of different technologies, whether it runs from life sciences, which can include pharmaceutical products, diagnostic tests, or it can be in electrical engineering, which involves things like battery storage uh, and related technologies. So we're sort of technology agnostic here. Now I have to be because I have zero technical background in anything. I, my undergraduate major was philosophy and economics, so I have no scientific training. But remember, the people who I have to persuade uh, to adopt my client's position, they don't have a technical training either. I'm talking to judges who don't have technical training, and I'm talking to jurors who don't have technical training. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't need the help of people who do have a technical training. And that's, for example, where people like Jasper come in uh, are essential because Jasper does have a technical background, which can be very helpful to understanding the technology and litigating a case. Jasper, wouldn't you agree? Yes, I agree. Um, but at the same time, the technology is so diverse that my technical background is in chemistry and biology, but I often mm -hmm. litigate cases dealing with computer chips and semiconductors and whatnot. So having the exact fit for the technical background is not necessary. It's about the, the courage to just roll up your sleeve and dive into, the, dive into the technology and kind of learn what's going on. I think that's what separates the, the science versus the non-science people. And to give a little more color to what David said earlier, um, about 90 to 90%, 95% of IP litigation is really patent litigation. And the, the rest, like 5 to 10% is like trade secret, copyright, and trademark litigation. So you can see like majority of the, the big law IP work is really concentrate on IP litigation. And as to patent itself, there's three kind of IP attorney when it comes to uh, technically patent attorney. There's the prosecutor, there's the transactional attorney, and there's the litigator, which are David and I. Um, and in prosecution is not like um, federal prosecutors. Prosecuting means filing patent application with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, trying to obtain a, a patent for the, the client. And then transactional is like two companies merging one another, trying to acquire one another, and you want to do your due diligence with investigating what uh, intellectual property assets each company have. And, and then there's the litigation, which is um, one company asserting their patents against another and trying to exclude the other from using the patents. So, so I think you both answered my uh, my following question, but just just to make sure I'm getting this right, you don't have to be good at math or science. You just have to be willing to work with people that are good at math and science. That's exactly right. You know, I think I have one of the best jobs ever, which is that clients pay me money to learn how stuff works. 
I like learning how stuff works. It's sort of like reverse college. Yeah. In college, I have to pay someone else to teach me how things work. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm the one that gets paid. And it's really, a, it's really a pretty fantastic job. I can tell you that I get involved with technologies that sound like science fiction to me. Uh, let me give you an example. Quite a number of years ago, I was contacted by a company that had not yet launched its product but it was about to launch its product. And I, they said, we're gonna have a big patent fight and we need some help. And I said, okay. So they came into my office, to talk about what their, what their product was gonna be. And they said, here's what we can do. So we can take a blood draw from a pregnant woman and we can identify little bits of fetal DNA floating around in mom's bloodstream. We can sequence that DNA and we can determine to about 99.9% .9 accuracy whether the fetus is at risk of having Down syndrome or another chromosomal abnormality. So the alternative test at the time was called amniocentesis, which involves a very, very long needle and has a small but very tangible risk of causing damage to the fetus. Didn't happen often, right. but it did happen. This technology literally has taken over. This is the new standard of care. It's been about 10 years since it, since it launched and it went from being something that sounded like we can do that really to it's just the standard of care for every pregnant woman. And this is the sort of very exciting things that I get to see are really profound, tangible changes in science that really improve the quality of people's lives, whether through um, a better phone or through better medical treatment. Wow. I mean, re really, really well put uh, and an excellent example. Um, and and yeah, I mean, it's it. I, I like that. It's like you're, uh, you're you're getting paid to learn. And it's uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I like how that's how you put that, David. Um, I guess you, you all really kind of kind of tackled my, my questions of what, what it's like being an IP attorney or, or what, what makes you all different than other attorneys. I guess I'd like to segue from here into some basic IP terminology just to kind of primer our guests for our discussion of, of patent waivers. And I think maybe the most basic term that, that we'll have to get out there is, I mean, what what is a patent? Well, that's a good question if we're going to talk about patent rights. A patent, very simply, is a right to exclude for a term of years. A patent doesn't give the patent holder any other rights. It's not like I have now the right to use an invention. What I have is the right to exclude others from using what I have invented for a term of years. And a patent is basically a bargain. Well, what do I mean by a bargain? It's a bargain with the public. And here's the nature of the bargain. When you get a patent, the patent is public. Everyone can see it. And in your patent, you are required to disclose every little thing that a person of ordinary skill in the field of technology would need to know to make and use the invention. In return for making that full disclosure, you can have exclusivity on your invention for a period of years. The period is 20 years starting on the date your application was filed. So it takes a while to get a patent, so you actually don't really get 20 years. You'll get 18, 17, 16, 15. It can take a while to, uh, to get a patent. And how is it that you get a patent? Like, well, what you have to show is that what you claim to have invented is different enough from what came before that you are deserving of your own patent protection. If what you did was already done by somebody else, no patent for you. If what you've done was very close to what somebody else did, and it would have been obvious to somebody of skill in the art to essentially take a prior invention, modify it a little bit, and come up with what you did, again, no patent for you. So what can you get a patent on? Well. Many things. You can get a patent on a, 
a new and improved machine, a new and improved apparatus, a new composition of matter, a new process. What can't you get a patent on? Well, you can't get patents on laws of nature. So for example, if I discover um, a new element and it gets added to the periodic table, that's like an amazing discovery, right? Fantastic. People were Harold David Gindler for years, but I can't get a patent on it because it's just a law of nature. If I discover a new mathematical algorithm, it's amazing. This mathematical algorithm is going to allow people to build better buildings. No patent for David Gindler. But if I come up with a way of improving the structural integrity of a building using my mathematical algorithm, maybe there is a patent for David Gindler. So the application of a mathematical algorithm in a concrete way, so to speak, can be patentable, as opposed to laws of nature, mathematical formulas. So Albert Einstein, E equals MC squared, it's brilliant. No patent for Albert Einstein, although he did once work in the patent office. <laughs> I mean, and, and you say, like, so to, to get a patent, you have to disclose a bunch of information. I mean, is it so much information that somebody could simply copy your idea, like once that patent's out or in like break the law and copy that idea right away? Is like that much information disclosed to the public or are you allowed to like keep some things back to, you know, disallow that? Oh, you are not allowed to keep things back. That's the bargain. You actually have to okay. uh, disclose. So there is a requirement in the patent law, which is called the enablement mm -hmm. requirement. And what you have to do is you have to enable the full scope of your invention. That means you got to tell okay. everybody else how it's done. That's called enabling uh, others to do it. You do not get to hold yeah. back. If you want to hold back, that's a different path. That's called the trade secret path. You okay. can actually yep. keep yep. something secret because you think that it's better if no one else knows how to do it. And trade secrets can last for as long as you keep it secret. And there are reasons why sometimes people choose to protect their inventions through trade secrets. And there are some times when people choose to uh, protect their inventions through the patenting process. I would say it's more common to protect your invention through the patenting process, but there are some, there are some types of inventions which, which may not be as available for patent protection as others. And so um, right. here's an example. You know, it's probably a better idea for the Coca-Cola company to have kept the formula secret because it lasts forever. And mm -hmm. why would you want a 20 year patent protection on a formula for a beverage? I think you'd want to have that protection right. for like forever because it's your beverage. And the moment people can copy your beverage, you know, and your secret sauce. So people have tried and, you know, doesn't quite taste like Coke. So that worked out pretty well for them. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Some people, they're not Pepsi people, they're Coke people. Right. It can get can get tough in the in the South when somebody asks you if you want a Coke and they give you a Pepsi. <laughs> yep, and this is the same is true for Listerine, for example. You know, something really simple to make. Uh, if you mm -hmm. just disclose the whole process, then someone can just copy it. Then you want to keep it a trade secret because you you just don't get as many pants on it. And David, you should tell the guests about um, the number of pants you can get on just a technology. So Jasper raises a really interesting point, which is you think you come up with an invention and you get a patent. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be true, but you can get many, many patents off of a single application. And this is true both in the United States and around the world. An important point to keep in mind, patents are territorial. Each country has its own patent system and the patents apply only to uh, activities in the United States. So Interesting, okay. uh, the United States has patents and I can sue people who commit infringing acts in the United States. If there is somebody who is committing an infringing act in the United Kingdom and they're not selling their product in the United States, there's not much I can do about it unless I have a patent in the UK. But what happens is you, is you can file an original application and you, in fact, may have a whole variety of different inventions in your application. And so you can first get okay. an issued patent on 
of one invention. And then you can keep, call, let's call it prosecuting your patent. You file what's called a continuation application. And then you can get another patent. And then perhaps you have still another inventive idea that's in there. And you can keep on prosecuting your patents. And you can get another patent out there. Now, this process um, used to be exploited in a very unfortunate way before a significant change in the patent law that took place in 1995. In 1995, uh, in 1995, before the law changed in June, there was an alternative test for how long a patent lasted. It was the longer of 20 years from the date of filing or 18 years from the date of issuance. So think about it. You could keep a patent application pending for years and years, and you could watch industry grow, and you could try to make sure yeah. that you could craft your patent claims to cover what's happening in industry. So that's gone uh, and has been gone for a very, very uh, long time. But that's how you can get many patents on a single idea. This can become and has become sometimes controversial in uh, the pharmaceutical business because what you will find is that pharmaceutical companies are very creative about um, how they obtain patent protections. And you will often find dozens of patents which protect a given product. And in recent okay. years, there have been outcries over what have been, what have been called patent thickets that surround certain kinds of pharmaceutical products. Interesting. And I mean, even though we won't talk about that Maybe particularly, well, maybe we will. I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not the expert on the uh, the COVID vaccines, but I, I guess that's a perfect segue into uh, kind of our topic for uh, for today's episode, which is patent waiver of COVID vaccines. And so, just to kind of give some uh, some background detail to our audience, you have, um, you know, since, since U.S. pharmaceutical companies successfully created effective COVID vaccines, uh, there's been this demand globally to share this technology uh, with the world. In particular, uh, you have India and South Africa that led proposals through the World Trade Organization uh, that would allow countries to choose neither to grant nor enforce patents or other IP related to COVID-19 drugs, vaccines, and technologies for the duration of the pandemic. And that proposal is backed by over 100 nations. Um, and so, you know, that we, we've kind of got some background on the patent process, but what, what is patent waiver? Well, patent waivers can come in a variety of different flavors. So what you've talked about is a movement to literally have countries declare patents to be unenforceable for COVID vaccines. And what that means, well, that can mean a lot of different things because there's a lots of technologies that underlie making COVID vaccines. But the basic idea is essentially for some period of time, holders of patents directed to COVID vaccines would not be able to enforce them. The proposal is pretty controversial and it's really been implemented nowhere. Uh, but what has happened though, is that the makers of the COVID vaccines, principally Pfizer and BioNTech on one hand, and Moderna, on the other hand, have said they do not plan to enforce any of their patents to stop anybody from making a COVID vaccine during the pandemic. So there is literally no patent issue from the two major vaccines standing in the way of anybody making a vaccine. So in effect, the world has what all the patent waivers are proposing, no enforcement of uh, of the patents during uh, during the pandemic. But that sort of begs another question, which is, 
have patents played really any role in slowing the global distribution of vaccines? And the answer is no. Have you heard about a patent infringement lawsuit that's stopping the global distribution of vaccines? Because if you have, tell me about it, because I haven't heard about it anywhere. There are many issues which create obstacles to the global distribution of needed medicines. There are trade barriers. There are other distribution mechanisms which are going to get stressed when you have to distribute something to like a couple billion people. That is a profound global undertaking. The process of doing that, if just getting a patent waiver were the solution, wow, we would be all vaccinated around the world by now. But that's really not the issue. What's interesting, though, is that even some of the brands like Pfizer and BioNTech, BioNTech is actually helping one particular organization in Africa to get their copy of the BioNTech vaccine on the market. So that's remarkable, but it tells you something else, which is that it's not just the patent, which is sort of the secret sauce. You have to understand what a COVID vaccine is. COVID vaccines are what is referred to as a biologic. It is made of biological material. It's not like a pill, like, you know, Lipitor is a pill. It's made from chemicals. It's super easy to make. You can convert any factory from making, you know, Lipitor to some other small molecule. They're called small molecules because they're just a bunch of chemicals that are put together. Biologics, so, are much harder to make uh, because they involve biological material. Both of the leading vaccines are what are called mRNA. mRNA is what's called a transcript that can be read by cell mechanisms to create a protein. And in this case, it codes for the spike protein on the top of, you know, that surrounds the coronavirus. And that's what scientists did. They sequenced the entire coronavirus, and they said, what would be a good target? Well, the spike proteins are a unique indicator of the coronavirus. So they coded just for the spike protein, or just actually one of them. They created an mRNA transcript. They put it into a little container. It is a container. It's a really small container called a nano container. And when you get the vaccine, you're injected with the mRNA in the little nano container, which then goes into your bloodstream, gets delivered to your cells. Your cells see an mRNA transcript, and your cells say, mRNA, I know what to do with that. I make proteins from that. So your cells make these little spike proteins. Then your body says, spike proteins, you don't belong here. And your body has this extraordinary immune system. It's like incredible. And your body looks at that and says, oh, Mr. Spike Protein, you should not be here. And so your body generates antibodies. So now you have this robust immune response. So if the spike protein actually comes to you as part of the coronavirus, those same antibodies look at that and say, I remember you. You're that spike protein I don't like. And the antibodies go right after the coronavirus itself. And so this is the principle behind all vaccines, which have been around for literally hundreds of years. People didn't know exactly how they worked for a long time ago, but they did understand that you were provoking an immune response. So we've had profound vaccines for years, starting with things like polio, which is now largely globally eradicated. And why is that the case? Because everybody got it. If everybody gets it, the virus has no place to go and it eventually just peters out. I'll expand on something David said earlier so the audience can uh, understand what's going on. So there's no secret sauce in the pants because if you 
recall the patents is the, in the exchange of the right to exclude for disclosure of knowledge of how to make the invention. So the, 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 the difficulty here is like the know-how of actually how to make that invention. Here's the, the COVID vaccines. For example, the, the Pfizer biotech, uh, BioNTech COVID vaccines takes like 50,000 steps to make and it's very complex and most of it are very difficult to, do, to replicate. And to add to some of the issues that David mentioned earlier, he mentioned trade barrier. There's also the raw materials issue. There's the, the limited number of manufacturing plants around the world that's already like ramping up to capacity. There's a lack of skilled scientists to replicate in making the vaccine. There's the global supply chain issue that deals with the, the distribution of vaccines. So this whole patent waiver debates really miss the issue. Um, that's not what's stopping the, the distribution of vaccines globally. Well, well, thank you. I mean, I, I've I got a, I got a lot in my head now. I think, and I mean, I guess for, first, thank you, David, for explaining that because I, I tried to Google it when I had uh, got my vaccine and I was had a really bad night's sleep. Uh, as I, I I suppose now I know my immune system was really getting to work, uh, and and so I mean it's it is it's it's really fascinating how mRNA technology works. I guess one follow up question I have just to that that part alone is, I mean, how does does that differ from the the COVID like pills, the uh, what is it, the antivirals or something like that? Because I've noticed that you know some pharmaceutical companies seem to be willing to share that technology uh, or license it or, or something of that regard. Um, maybe more so than their um, than their vaccines, and, and so I'm I'm kind of curious how, how do those how do those two things compare? They they are entirely different classes of medicines. So as I okay. mentioned, the vaccine is a biologic; it's made of biological material, mRNA. The mm -hmm. method of making a vaccine of making almost any biologic is very complex. You know, there are right. many kinds of biologics which are on the market. You know, a vaccine is just one example. There are many biologic treatments for disease, some really profound uh, treatments for disease, which have had a huge impact um, in a really positive way using biological material. An example would be specially engineered antibodies which do not exist in nature, which are designed to treat certain kinds of diseases. And there are now specially designed antibodies that are used to treat certain kinds of cancer and that can be used to treat macular degeneration. So these are tremendous medicines, but they're hard to make because they're biologics. Okay. They were, they're a completely different manufacturing process than making pills. Pills we call small molecule drugs because they're small. They're okay. just, you know, basically chemicals put together in a certain way. The ability to distribute a pill that would treat COVID, that is a much easier endeavor than the kind of manufacturing ramp up that we, would be required for vaccines because the know-how is fundamentally different. And it would be considerably easier for a company like, say, Pfizer, which has developed a very effective COVID pill to treat people who have gotten COVID and to help them not get a serious case. The ability to sort of have that involved in global distribution and manufactured around the world, that's much easier. There are generic companies around the world that could in my estimation, easily ramp up. So you, you see the issues dealing with the COVID vaccines, you don't really see them in the COVID pills because the, the, like David said, the manufacturing process of the pills are much easier to make. So when it comes to patent waiver, if companies start waiving patents on the pills, others can easily replicate it. So that's why you, you see that they start licensing their patents because they want to recoup some of the R&D uh, they put into the research uh, to come up with the pills. Well, and really, the licensing itself is the end game of a litigation dispute. Because if a company wins, you get to collect money on your pants, which is the same thing as licensing. 
uh, you get some money on Japan, no one's going to jail here. It's not criminal law, civil law. So th that's why you see company not really enforcing the patents on the pills, rather than they just take money for licensing, which is pretty much the same thing. Got it, got it. I, I guess that kind of leads me back to a different question uh, I had, and it's, it's regarding what you were talking about, David, with companies like Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, saying that they won't enforce COVID-19 uh, patents. And so this kind of, um, particularly my, my question relates to something that happened earlier this month, so uh, earlier this month, researchers in South Africa stated they're nearly completed the process of reproducing Moderna's mRNA vaccine. Moderna's repeatedly said it won't enforce its COVID-19 patents. But I guess, I guess two-part question. One, is saying you're not going to enforce a patent for the duration of the pandemic different than a patent waiver? And two, does that open up these South African researchers, for example, to risks of litigation once the pandemic's over for what they did during the pandemic? So you have literally hit your head on the nail, hit the nail on the head, so to speak, which is this is why people are dissatisfied with the patent waivers, which is when does the quote pandemic end and the endemic begin? Right. So I don't know the answer to that question. And so what you have is worry that, uh, People will invest a whole bunch of money in reliance on a patent waiver. And then the drug companies will declare an end to the pandemic, a beginning of the endemic, and then start to enforce their patents against everybody. That is a very, very good policy issue that needs to be addressed. I can tell you my own thinking about this drug companies act in their self-interest that's what businesses do for a living but they also have good reasons to act in the public interest because there will be a mm -hmm. profound backlash if people believe that drug companies are preventing the end of an endemic because an endemic doesn't sound so much better than a pandemic but I recognize that people who invest would like to have some clarity about what the future holds. I think it would behoove companies like Pfizer and Moderna to provide more clarity as to exactly what they mean in terms of we're not going to enforce our patent rights during the pandemic. What does that mean? Because the World Health Organization will at some point say there's no longer a pandemic, but it's now endemic. That doesn't mean that COVID has gone. COVID is going to be here with us for a while. What it does mean is, uh, is that there's been a change, but one where vaccines are still going to be uh, greatly needed. And so that's, I think, the policy consideration that's going to go on here. I would personally be surprised if the solution is a patent waiver. Uh, that's a very, very significant step. And I actually can't think of a situation in modern times where you've had a government initiated broad patent waiver. I can think of situations where you've had industry led patent waivers. So an example is Tesla. Tesla's got like a gazillion patents on the whole electric vehicle thing. They don't enforce all of them. They, to be clear, they have some they're happy to enforce. But what they wanted to do was to build up an infrastructure because it's good if there are like lots of charging stations around. And so that yeah. means, you know, <laughs> having other electric car makers, you know, that's a good thing. But if you have your patent right. standing in a way, that's not a good thing. So Tesla was mm -hmm. smart about that. One other thing you should know is that historically, pharmaceutical companies have been pretty good about licensing what I'll call platform technologies on reasonable commercial terms. That is a way of making a kind of drug that's applicable to many different kinds of diseases. 
Uh, here's an example. Genentech had a family of patents which covered uh, a groundbreaking way of making genetically engineered antibodies. And Genentech was one of the first companies to get into that business. But many other companies wanted to get into that business too. Genentech licensed those patents to anybody who wanted it on commercially reasonable terms as long as you weren't making a product that was directly competitive with the Genentech product. And even then they actually licensed the patents to some people who were doing that as well. Why did they do that? Because it was the right thing to do. Because they wanted to see the science adopted broadly for the betterment of the treatment of disease. And that technology has led to an array of treatments which have been groundbreaking, not just from companies like Genentech, but from companies like Amgen, and Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibb, Regeneron, I could go on. Uh, and they have really had a profound impact. So people don't often think that drug companies are sort of on their side. But, you know, I work with lots of scientists, and drug companies are basically companies which are made up of smart scientists who work really, really long hours because what they want to do is cure disease. And when you talk to some of those people, you'll get a very good feeling about, um, maybe a better feeling about the biotechnology industry. Let me give you one example. You know, Genentech for many years was, its CEO was a scientist named Art Levinson. And when he became, when he was a CEO, he wanted everyone at the company to understand why they were there. And so draped on the outside of Genentech buildings, Genentech has a huge campus, you know, like 35 buildings in South San Francisco, draped on the outside of the buildings were pictures of people who were successfully being treated with Genentech products. The whole point of the, doing that is, why are we here? We're here to treat these people. They're just average people out there, randomly selected with huge pictures draped on buildings. I thought that was a very powerful way of reminding everybody, this is the business that we're in. It's also good marketing, but I'll, I'll try to... Uh... It is good marketing. I'll try to uh, crystallize what David said in a different way um, for the audience. So when you talk about patent waiver, there's there's a question of scope. Um, you kind of touch on the duration of the patent is during the pandemic, after the pandemic, and w w when is the exact time? Is it defined by the, uh, the WTO or is it by the nation, uh, by each individual nation? Um, and then there's other ways to slice and dice the, the, the patent waiver scope as well. For example, there's, is it individual pans? Is it several pans? Is it, there's the issue of pan tickets that David talks about. Um, is it by subject matter? For example, you, uh, you weigh pans on the, the product itself, but not the method of making the pan. Um, and then David and I had a, 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 a long discussion on the, the South Africa's vaccines and what's really what's its impact. And the difficulty we see is that even though they say they successfully made the vaccines, the, what they would face is the clinical trials. Are they going to pass the clinical trial, which is going to be in November of this year? And we are talking about COVID vaccine 1.0. Um, that's dealing with the alpha and beta strands of COVID and not the delta and omicron and whatever later alphabets it is. So um, th there's this lag in technology when it comes to patent disclosure and there's this whole race of like coming up with the next vaccines for the, the latest alphabet uh, variants. So it's good news that South Africa is being very innovative from that aspect, but for it to be useful is a very different question that we, we are skeptical of that aspect. Right, well, and I guess a, a follow-up to what you're saying, Jasper, and, and David, feel free to answer this as well. I mean, if, I like, Yes, these the, the pharmaceutical companies have said that they're they're not going to enforce them during the pandemic. But can they retroactively enforce them after the pandemic? Like, I mean, are, are they just stating, "Hey, we won't sue you now, but we may sue you 
for what you did within the statute of limitations? Or are they, or, or would a court see it as they're kind of acquiescing for anything that's being done during this period? So there are legal principles that uh, even non-IP lawyers would understand that would, I think, prevent uh, a company like Pfizer from going back on its word. So things like estoppel, um, because okay. if you have a company which relies to the detriment on the promise of another and acts to its detriment, right. you remember that concept. It's called promissory estoppel. Yep. So there uh -huh. are lots of uh, there are lots of rules that I think would prevent okay. that. So of the many worries which we might have about um, how to make sure we have a you know a robust global distribution of the vaccines, I don't think. Uh, we should be worrying very much about uh, Pfizer or Moderna going back on a global promise that they have made. Right. Okay. Well, I, I guess, I mean, you, you all have answered uh, my past questions really, really excellently. One, one part I'm still kind of wondering about, I mean, I think you both have touched really well on why a patent waiver probably, you know, wouldn't help. But I mean, there, there are some companies or groups that are saying, you know, despite the manufacturing, despite these other things, there may still be some uses uh, or some some benefits to maybe not just like patent waiver, but open source IP for biotechnology during the pandemic. And so uh, in particular, I'm talking about um, I read an article by the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, uh, and they talked about open source IP and their creation of the the COVID uh, like moonshot project, which I believe is an antiviral. And so I'm kind of curious. I mean, what what are your thoughts on on that? That there should have been some open source effort to create a COVID vaccine in the first place, and that pharmaceutical company shouldn't have been you know close hold on mRNA technology from the get go. So I've read about um, this open source work. You know what I haven't read about an open source vaccine, because there are so many steps which are involved in not just coming up with the idea for a vaccine and even sort of a prototype in the lab, but so like, then what do you do? Because then there's a whole lot of steps that involve manufacturing, manufacturing enough to have a clinical trial, having the people who will run the clinical trials and who know how to do that. And by the way, Running a clinical trial is not just a matter of getting a bunch of people and shooting them in the arms with your, uh, with your vaccine. There are protocols and there are ways of what are called powering your clinical trial to make sure that you're getting results that show that your vaccine is better than a placebo or better than something else. There are so many more steps that come after that. So what would have to happen? Well, I suppose you could have government intervention and you could have the government then come along and tell uh, a large pharma company, okay, large pharma company, here is this vaccine that you didn't come up with, but what a bunch of researchers came up with and we want you to try that. Well, why? Why, why that candidate? And why should it, why should it be done that way? You know, Pfizer and Moderna spent time trying to figure out what was the best way to create an mRNA vaccine. They found people who were specialists in this. They went to some of the brightest people, including people who were not working in private industry. Uh, you know, people like um, Kizzy Corbett, who is at the National Institutes of Health. In reality, the patent system drives innovation. That's why the ability of Congress to make laws to protect inventions is in the United States Constitution. That's what enables Congress to enact what is today called the Patent Act, and it had its predecessors because that's what promotes innovation. Now, regulation of innovation is critical. You just can't have companies doing whatever they want, and that's why we have great places like the FDA, because just, just because you come up with a medicine doesn't mean you get to market it. There are rigorous ways of ensuring that it is safe 
and effective. But would you have gotten vaccines out as quickly, but for the fact that we have tools in place to drive innovation? Think about it. So coronavirus really becomes known in December 2019, January of 2020. We have clinical trials starting, you know, in the summer of 2020. That is incredible. And you need a company that has resources and know-how and motivation to get that done. It is extraordinary. And I cannot underscore this enough. Extraordinary that we have not one, but two vaccines that are highly effective at keeping people out of the hospital and that were being administered a year into the pandemic. Uh, that strikes me as success. Patents are not standing in the way of those products being distributed globally. There are many other things which are standing in the way, including politics. And this is probably not the time for politics to stand in the way. Uh, patents and the patent system help to drive that innovation. And keep in mind one more thing. One reason we were able to develop that vaccine so quickly is because the mRNA technology was already there. We already had the idea of using mRNA to make a vaccine. And so when COVID came around, people just jumped on it and said, we can solve this problem. And they did. So it's harder for me to see what went wrong. I don't think anything went wrong. I think everything went right, at least in terms of developing a vaccine very quickly that was found to be safe and effective. And now it's the responsibility, in my view, of governments, large and small, to distribute that to the world population. Well, I, I feel like, David, that, that segue is really, really good into a closing question uh, that I have for you all, which is, you know, th there's obviously this outcry for for pat patent waivers. Uh, you both have give given a lot of a lot of really good reasons for for why that probably won't happen, or or you know wouldn't wouldn't be helpful. I mean, what has to go, or what do you think will go right to end that outcry? Right, like is it is it going to be a solution in manufacturing or U.S. pharmaceutical companies, or or are the politics going to get out of the way? I mean, do do you all have any, any inkling from your uh, from your viewpoint on what, what this looks like, what the way ahead looks like to, to end that outcry and to, and to get, you know, COVID vaccines or, or, the, or, you know, immunization in the world. It's hard for me to predict what will end the outcry and the outcry may not end. And the reason the outcry may not end is for the following. We need to think about wise practices for the next pandemic, because I've got news. This is not the last one. And the next one may not be as, um, as pernicious as the current pandemic, but I don't think I'm giving away the farm here to say that there's probably gonna be another one. <clears throat> so outcry probably isn't the right word. We now have the ability, we've been through this pandemic, We've seen all the things that went right, and we've seen all the things that went wrong. So why don't we get smart heads in rooms together and figure out how we're going to address the next pandemic and how we're going to ensure global distribution of the vaccines that we have. So right now we have them. What's the goal here? Get them out to the rest of the world immediately. Are patents standing in the way of that? It doesn't seem like it at least not from Moderna and from Pfizer. So let's actually solve that problem. And then let's have wise policymakers at the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and the leaders of the industrialized world figure out how we are going to ensure that when this happens again, we are gonna have a plan in place to distribute the vaccines quickly to everybody who needs one. 
So outcries are good. They mobilize people to think about how to solve a problem. So I agree. Let's figure out what the solution is to the problem. I agree with David that patent doesn't really stand in the way. So for the audience, if you've been following the conversation along, um, the, the issue isn't really the patent waiver. The issue is about global distribution, raw material, skilled scientists, manufacturing plans, for example, uh, trade barriers, and so global supply chain when it comes to COVID vaccines. So, and if you understand journalism and the news, and I mean, they need something to make noise out of. They just, except that they just missed this whole debate about patent waiver because that's just not the, the right issue. So uh, I agree with David in the sense that um, it's, patent should be there to protect innovation, to encourage more innovation for the future. Um, and it, it really focused people to, to the issue, the debates. But I, I just don't think that they're getting the issue quite correctly. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jasper and David. I have one closing question. And just to give some background for our, for our, for one final closing question and to give, to give some background for our audience. Uh, so Millbank, uh, I think since the pandemic has kind of taken the lead on compensation uh, at big law firms. And so I got to ask one final question, which is, does Millbank have uh, any more salary increases planned for the near future? Well, why would you ask a question like that, being a law student? <laughs> so let me answer the question this way. Millbank has been a leader in compensation for our associates. That is something we do quite intentionally. It's not like we just happen to be a leader that tries to set, uh, really tries to be out in front of ensuring that our associates are paid uh, what they deserve and to be essentially the market mover on that front. What I can tell you is the firm is very intentional about it and I think they plan to continue to be the market mover on that. So as we look at the market in 2022, I think Millbank will continue to be a market leader in setting associate compensation. And remember that associate compensation has sort of many different features to it. There is the base salary, where you can be a market leader there. And then there are bonuses, and you can be a market leader there. So there are going to be other opportunities in 2022 for Millbank to be a market leader. I'm proud that we do that. We think it's not just sort of good enough to eventually wind up at the right place. We think it's important as a global law firm that holds itself out to a standard of excellence, which is quite high. We expect a lot from our attorneys. That's the sort of business where you want to be a market leader in compensation and to be the first mover. I'm, I'm very proud that we are. It's really sort of part of the mill bank culture. It's a culture of excellence, but also a culture of equity. And you build equity and inclusion and diversity by recognizing the value of your communities. And one way, not the only way, one way of doing that is to get out in front of compensation issues. And so of the many ways that we tried to promote a strong culture here, that is one. I'll, I'll add that if the past indication, past performance and indication of future behavior, then Milbank's already outdone itself with raising base salary for four times in the past five years. So I, I mean, maybe four more times in the next five years uh, would be my prediction. But then I, I don't know, I'm just predicting uh, based on nothing. Uh, except past behavior. Um, but I also mentioned that, uh, that when I talk to law students, um, they recognize our name because it's now being associated with uh, the compensation scale. So it's helpful from that perspective. I mean, I mean, absolutely. I mean, a lot of, a lot of law students, you know, we weigh firms for a lot of reasons, but you know, I think that, uh, that that's one of them, no doubt. And I will, uh, I will leave it at that. I will let our, uh, our audience 
perhaps you know get excited about the, the potential foreshadowing and what both of you just said you know who knows you know we would i know nothing's set in stone yet but uh yeah i mean that i that that is uh that is really interesting the 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 conversation on ip and uh and patent waiver has been incredibly insightful i mean uh, i really really um appreciate david and jasper both of you sharing your expertise uh with me and with the audience i guess uh kind of to you know piggyback off of what you said david i guess th one of the things i like about being a podcast host is i get to learn a lot uh for free i suppose i don't know uh <laughs> so it is uh it, it has been really uh, an absolute pleasure having both of you on the show um thanks so much for being here thank you Kevin. thank you very much it's been a pleasure it's been a pleasure as well thanks for listening Emphasis Added is a podcast by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you heard, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and follow the Houston Law Review on social media or check us out on HoustonLawReview.org. Till next time.